This is the Mixed Martial Arts Beat for the first week of June 2014. Hello again everyone, I'm Ariel Hawani inside our New York City studio and it feels like it's been ages since we've done one of these shows and that means there is a lot to talk about on this week's episode of The MMA Beat. I am excited, I hope you are as well. There he is, Luke Thomas. He is back from the Sirius XM Fight Club and MMAfighting.com. Mike Chiapetta as well is back. He is from FoxSports.com and the man in the hat, Chuck Mindenhall, she's back in the Shout saddle as well. Shout out to Kenny Winslow, my homegirl. <laughs> wow, yeah, where has she been? Both her and Mazzagatti, MIA. So how much of a homegirl is she? <laughs> we'll discuss that later. Consoling CJ Ross, probably. <laughs> Guys, we don't have time to talk about this nonsense. We have a lot to get to There's here. There's other nonsense to talk John about. John <laughs> Jones, the saga that is John Jones versus the UFC. It continues to unfold, and we must say that we are taping this Thursday afternoon here in New York City, and John Jones and his management team, they are scheduled to meet with the UFC brass later on today in Las Vegas. So a lot can change by the time we are taping this and when this comes out, so keep that in mind. But still, up until this point, it's been a very rocky road since UFC 172, and it's one that dates back to UFC 151 when that show was canceled, of course. But what do you make of the way this has been presented to the public, from Dana White, to what John Jones does and doesn't do, to what Alexander Gustafson is saying. What's your take on this whole situation as it stands right now? Of anyone who has the most normal behavior, it's Alexander Gustafson. Take, <laughs> taking the social true. media to ask for a fight is fairly pedestrian in this day and age. So I, don't, I think his is uh, very explainable and understandable. And, and I think the way in which the UFC has gone about this is very understandable and explainable. They typically have the leveraging power at to assign fights. Listen, this guy's number one contender. We decide that both based on a management decision and consensus about what we can sell, what fan demand is about and you know when I say you know uh, uh, managerial decisions or brass decisions based on merit of, of accomplishment by and large obviously right. um, and so that in some ways it's all sort of very ordinary I think what we're seeing here is a paradigm shift or at least maybe not even that maybe just ripping off the band-aid and seeing how the world actually works here John Jones is exercising what was always there which is this is a power-driven sport might makes right you know he, most guys at his level Matt Hughes say or a GSP or a Chuck Liddell they worked in concert with UFC as partners and I think in some senses John Jones believes acting together that everyone can be mutually beneficial he's not going to be dictated to he's just he's just not he's not going to be uh, for better or worse and I, I, I think he should fight Gustafson. I'm not mad at the Cormier fight, but personally speaking, I would prefer to see that. But the reality is, um, he believes it's a meritorious decision that he can make. He also believes that he has the right to make it. He's not going to be lectured to. And I just think what you're finding out is that as an independent contractor, the UFC is going to have to find a way to work with him one way or the other. To your point, quickly, I, you know, it's just speculation. We have no way of knowing. I really believe that he never got over 151 hmm. and the way he got murdered in the public for it. And Greg Jackson, too, you know. I think that he feels like Chuck Liddell is in that inner, inner, inner circle. And by virtue of his status, champion, youngest champion ever, he's there by, def, you know, by, by default. He's not there really in a celebrated way. And so he's going to act for what he perceives, right or wrong, as his own interests. There's always this feeling out there that for John Jones, he's always worried about what the public's going to say about him. He's always kind of tailoring what he says to the public and he, that he's not always genuine. When, what I see in the way he conducts his career is the exact opposite. His professional career, he's completely in charge of. To, to him, he, he makes a decision, he sticks with it, whether it's right or wrong. I think he's certainly within his justifications to say, this is the fight I want, this is the fight I'm interested in. It may, may not end that way, maybe they'll come to a, an agreement, but the guy has been a dominant champion for a long time. Um, he's been, he's really their last star left. Him and Ronda Rousey, I would say, they're, they're biggest stars. I should say they're last stars, but they're biggest stars. The guy who can bring this company forward, and regardless of what people say, like, this guy's not catching on, this and that. When he has a fight now... He gets on the major shows. He gets on live with Michael and Kelly. He does things that only s sports superstars get to do. So he has the leverage now. And he didn't do it, you know, he's not the guy who put this out in the public, right? The UFC kind of, kind of hijacked the situation <laughs> a little bit. I thought it was interesting, you know, we, we were at UFC 173 and all of a sudden this ESPN report comes out saying that, hey, we have this this fight agreed to here on Gustafson's part, and this is the date we want. The only thing we're waiting on is John Jones. Is now looking back in hindsight, it's you wonder, you know, did they already know that Jones wanted Gustafson? Because at the time that report came out, Cormier had not fought yet. Cormier and Henderson had not fought yet. So 
who knows if Jones had already told him, I want the winner of that fight, or I want Cormier if he wins. It seems to, to me that maybe they were kind of saying, let's get out ahead of this now, so we, we kind of have the public behind this, because let's face it, a lot of the public wanted this fight. And I agree with Luke, like, there's nothing bad to say about if, if uh, Jones and Corm uh, Jones Gustafson fight. It's a great fight. A lot of people want to see the rematch. There's not much wrong with the Jones Cormier fight either. Everyone feels so justified in their opinion, like, oh, he needs to fight this guy. So if you're entitled to that opinion, how is Jones not? The, the thing that gets me is it was all so tidy, right? It was like we knew what was happening the whole way. Uh, once, once Jones and Gustafson fought the first time, everybody wondered when this rematch is happening. They go on, they have an obstacle because Jones, you know, at the time was like, you know, we, don't, we, we should keep things moving. That's the way it was sort of construed. So he fights Glover to share. We're all moving, though, towards this rematch. Jimmy Manuel was, uh, was beaten by Gustafson. Uh, so, so this is where we're heading. This is the way the UFC has presented it. That's where we're, this is how we're, you know, this is the road we're going down. And that's, and Daniel Cormier does fight, even after the report and all that. Daniel Cormier fights, we find out later that he's got a knee injury. He's not, you know, who knows what it is. It was an, a, an LCL that might be an ACL, you know, that he has to have surgery on. All these things are all uh, big gray areas and stuff like that. But uh, an injury is an injury. He's pretty happy in the immediate aftermath to just get his knee fixed up and, and wait. That's what the whole thing was. Is he going to wait? So we're all going along with this, uh, this, this scenario because Gustafson is already in line. Where we're all caught off guard is this left field sort of like, wait a minute, I would rather have Cormier. That just wasn't something that people saw, you know, happen. And the way it's all kind of played out too with the UFC, obviously, what you just uh, what you just talked about, kind of coming out, announcing the fight without his consent, without him signing on, uh, and Dana, putting out yeah. his, and putting out Jones's desire. Working, John, they were doing that behind the and scenes. And we're working on a new contract. You know, we're trying to get a new contract, but no, there's five fights. You know, five fights left on his existing. A week later, I mean, these things are all. You know, it throws a lot of um, black eyes each way. I feel like you, you, you can't really go, you can't blame Jones for dictating his and trying to get what he wants. He, it's not like he's calling out Dan Henderson. Or he's not like calling out somebody who makes no sense. He's calling out the guy who's sort of contender 1B, you know what I mean? And a guy who's very dangerous for him. Um, so it's, you see it both ways, but I, I feel like the whole situation is, Obviously, like you were saying, it could be resolved today. Ultimately, I feel like John Jones probably ends up fighting Gustafson. It's just my gut feeling on it uh, because at some point he's not going to want to be construed as he's ducking. And I feel like that's the message. That's the big problem I have with the UFC's uh, UFC.com piece that came out was basically this illusion that he's ducking the fight. You know, with all due respect, guys, I think you're missing the point here. <laughs> this has nothing to do with Gustafson. This has nothing to do with Cormier. Cormier is being used as a pawn in all of this. Yeah. This has everything to do with that contract. Remember in that embedded episode when they sat down with his management. Can we get a deal done? Can we get a deal done? Yep. What deal is to be done with a bout agreement? John Jones wants a new contract, and that's why Dana White came out and said, just to be clear, mm -hmm. he has five fights left. This guy can't renegotiate. What obviously happened was they couldn't get a deal done. And now they're saying, all right, you don't want that deal, now sign the bout agreement. And if you don't want that bout agreement, if you don't want to sign it, we're going to try to put it out there like you're ducking him. That's why John Jones, in my opinion, tweeted, there's a difference between bad press yeah. and bad exactly. business. Because someone is telling him, if you don't accept this fight, you're going to get some bad press. He doesn't care. He wants good business, not bad business. And that he, contract is bad business in his opinion. It's a fair theory, but couldn't he just reject the Gustafson fight until he gets a new contract? Why use... Cormier for leverage. Because I think that they want Gustafson. He knows they want Gustafson. And now they're saying, all right, if you don't take the <laughs> Gustafson fight, right, if you don't take it, we're going to do this interim title fight between uh, Cormier and, 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 and Gustafson. Well, guess what? You think they'd really do that? Guess what? That would be great for John. John has terrible for John. John has he, said he, he, over he, he and over again. He, he said these, these guys should fight, fight each other. Okay, well, that's also bad business for John. He Why? <laughs> Get rid of one of the guys. One of them loses. He doesn't have to okay, worry about it. In that sense, it's fine. But we're talking about building up a guy and talking about his greatness. And right. now you're gonna, while you have a sitting champion, you're gonna put an interim title there to undermine him. That belt. If they create an interim belt, that belt is a monument. Zufa's monument to the alleged ducking of John Jones. Sure. How is that good for him? All he'll say is, I got the real belt right here. Oh, yeah, but what is that belt? They, that's the fake have belt. Have they really cared about what's good for him? Look at that, know, that's, they're, that's, they're I, I agree, right? that's my so, point. That's my point. They're, they're not suddenly going to, that's not suddenly going to. That's why I'm saying John shouldn't be like, oh, I'm, you know, let's, let's do that. I, I, would, I, would, I find that crazy. I think John Jones wants to fight. He wants to fight with a better deal. So he will be, I think, okay with the idea. They're trying to dangle that carrot in front of him. As if to say, if you don't accept this fight, we're gonna do this instead. And I don't think he's gonna, I don't think he's gonna jump. 
because of that, you know, that being presented, because he's okay with that scenario. He's already said that he wants that scenario to be played out. At the end of the day, this has to do with dollars and cents. It has nothing to do with, and, and I think that Cormier is just being used as a pawn. Cormier is, is, is at the right place at the right time to be used as part of this negotiation. If there wasn't a Cormier, it would have been harder to do that. They couldn't have brought in, like, you know, a Shogun Hua in the yeah, mix. Yeah, there's no machine right. to rematch. Cormier is right. a perfect guy to use in this, but this has everything to do with that contract, and that's why they're talking about, he still has five fights. What are you talking about? I will say this, though. I do think there's a strain, and I, I, you know, you can debate the merits of it. Everyone thinks that fight was close, the first Gustafson sure. fight. I scored it for John, but it was down to the wire, you know? Um, I do think, though, there is a part of John that feels like he doesn't really have to rematch Gustafson. He probably would under the He's right circumstances. He's annoyed with the guy, yeah. He, but I think he feels like, and you know, I think most reporters know that behind the scenes, that probably wasn't John's best training camp. Gustafson may beat him in a rematch. I'm not trying to make claims about who's better. I'm just trying to say, if I'm putting myself in John's mind for just a little bit, he probably thinks, let's see, I went into this bout semi-prepared, got pushed a little bit, but came out in the end. If I prepare for this guy, he has no hope. So why do I really need to rematch him? I think he feels like Cormier might bring something else a little bit different to and the table. Also, from, from the beginning, he, he said when, when Gustafson got ma matched with Jimmy Manimua, he, he complained. He said, why, why doesn't he have a, a harder road to get back to the title? Right. This is a guy out of the top ten, Jimmy Manimua. He's never beaten anyone of any real renown in the UFC. Why doesn't Gustafson have to win a bigger fight? And that's a fair criticism, and that's why he wanted that Gustafson-Cormier fight that never materialized and probably won't. But... That's a, that's a legitimate argument for him to make. And, and let's not forget, he doesn't like Daniel Cormier. He's not trying to give the guy a title shot you know, or, or, or get him you know, this big opportunity. But I can see why he sees him as a, as a bigger challenge. Because that, that's what he's interested in. A lot in. of people might say that, that's, that that's the tougher fight. And that's the, the kind of silliness in all of this, the, the ducking thing. It's not like he's picking you know, the 35th exactly. ranked guy in the division. He's picking you know, a two-time Olympian, former Strike Force mm -hmm. champion. So that's what makes this kind of interesting. But I think... Going back to your point, leverage. How much leverage does John Jones really have? Because he's not a free agent. He's not Gilbert Melendez. He can't leave. He can't just say, I'm not taking this contract or these fights and I'm going to walk away. You know, he, he can't really exercise all that much power. So at some point, something's got to give. And it'll be interesting to see who wins out here. I could see this, this dragging out, and you know, I could be wrong in the next couple hours, yeah. but I could see this dragging out for quite some time. Stay tuned, we'll find out yesterday. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Only on UFC.com. <laughs> How do you guys see it playing out? Uh, uh, I, I see your point. You know, I, I'm trying to think of like the Eddie Alvarez situation, but this one's a little bit different, right? You could see a situation where if a fighter can make the case publicly, he's being abused by the uh, promotion. You know, these they're 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 holding these borderline illegal. I'm just making a theoretical example. Right. They're borderline illegal contracts and their clauses over me, I can't do what I want to do. In the Auburn situation, that burned Bellator badly. But in this particular case, at least right now, right now, the emotion is much more on UFC side. The fan sentiment is much more on UFC side, which Absolutely. is that you got to fight this guy, Gustus. And so mm -hmm. I don't know how sympathetic to John's demands they would be if this becomes an intractable situation. And the UFC is also facing a bit of a problem here. I mean, they had this with Nick and Nate. They're, they're dealing this with John. Guys in the midst of a contract are saying we want a new deal. How do they get around this situation? Because this is going to keep happening over and over again. You know, at the end of the day, you have a deal, you sign that deal. Can the UFC just say, you know, piss off, honor the deal? Well, you know, the thing the fighters can always point to is we signed a contract, you can cut me at any time, but I sure. can't renegotiate any time. And that's, that's a legitimate argument. Um, for Jones, I, I think it's fair for him to ask for a, a renegotiation, even if he has five left, fights left on his deal. The guy is becoming a bigger star every time out there. As I said, when you see the mainstream uh, attention that he gets now, is it... Does he have the leverage it, of a, a George St. Pierre? Like, he's never gotten that one not, million... Not, 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 you know not George I mean? St. Pierre at his prime. Uh, obviously, not, not even anywhere close yet right. at this point. But if you, t if you look at the current roster and guys who can possibly get there, who else is there? It's really Jones or Bust when it comes to like building a superstar. Is Ronda Rousey, I guess, potentially could get to a place where she gets a million buys with the right opponent, but it's a much more limited uh, window, I think, there. Velasquez, maybe. 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 Another guy with the right opponent or the right situation. But for, for Jones is the kind of guy who can be transcendent. With, you can kind of you know, see him as the sports LeBron James or, or you know, something of that nature where a lot of outside people are, are, are interested in, in the sport suddenly when they know he's going to fight. 
So he ha and, he, and he's also very young. He can say, listen, this is what I've done. I'm not even close to my prime. He's 26 years old. Mm. He's 26 years old. He's already beaten multiple Hall of Famers. He's basically undefeated in his career. And he's a guy that you know is going to kind of be a foundation for years to come. So pay me. And, and we keep talking about Jones. All of us have been talking about Jones Gustafson too being the biggest fight that could happen this year. Most of that, I'd say sure. that's pretty much most people's biggest fight that could happen this year. Um, so you look at that and you're like, well, if he's going to throw something, if they're trying to work out a new deal, if this is the time to do it, obviously, right before he takes on this big fight, maybe he doesn't feel it's adequate. I don't know what his deal is, but maybe he doesn't feel it's adequate for the type of position he's about to be in against a guy like us, and maybe he doesn't want. So he wants to be put in that position. And it is a little different with a guy like John Jones, which the UFC, I think, needs right now. They need those guys. They need those dominant champions because we're not seeing a lot of those. Hen and Burrell, who we was talking about as the best for pound for pound, just went down. Now, Joe, you know what I mean? There aren't a lot of guys who are occupying that space as these dominant champions. He's got more leverage than a guy like Nate Diaz, say, who's lost a couple of his recent bouts and all of a sudden realized he doesn't like his deal. That's a lot different. Sure. Um, so you, know, you, could see why, you could see why Jones is taking this time right now. If he's going to do it, this is the time. Very quickly, um, remember back in the days of Couture Hizzo? Couture was really pissed off because Hizzo, I think, was the first to get, first UFC fighter ever to get a six or seven fight contract. That was a big deal, you know, because it was security. This was the days of competing promotions, UFC was not what it is today back then. But now I think the situation's kind of reversed itself. These guys are signing these long contracts mm -hmm. and their value is changing dramatically in that space. So he, ha he might have five, five, lists on this con five fights on this contract, but when he first signed it, he probably thought the terms were good. However many right. fights expired in that time, his, his importance in the company changed dramatically. Yeah. And that wasn't happening back in those days. This is not Kaepernick setting, was it a seven year? I mean, how many, how many deals is it? 126 million? What is this long security blanket? These guys, their value to the company is changing mm -hmm. rapidly inside the space of these deals. My recommendation as a manager be signed three fight deals or five fight at the most. You know, what's interesting also is that the UFC can frame the way the fans think. And at the end of the day, they have to make money off of John Jones. I mean, they can stand to make a lot of money if they build him up to be a star, what they're doing with Ronda Rousey. So I'm wondering if all this, dating back to UFC 151, is counterproductive. Because now essentially what they're putting out there is that he doesn't want to fight the guy who he's supposed to fight. Isn't that kind of just shooting yourself in the foot as a promoter? Doesn't that make it a bigger fight though if and when it does happen? Because uh, you're, you're, essentially... you're, you're taking that chance. But there is some damage that is being done to Since John you... Jones, the superstar. Yes, and I'm sure they they probably feel like in the long term they can overcome that. Or it's going to take a little time. I mean, obviously, John Jones has ha sort of had a, an ebb and flow to the way he's been per perceived in the public. Some There's been a time when people sort of were gravitating to his side, when he was this humble, kind of likable. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, and then he, you know, started winning championships and started saying some things that are borderline cocky. And now he, but now he even admits that he's, he does have a level of arrogance to him. So, and, and we see some of these Instagram videos recently that he's posted and then pulled down. Uh, Can we all that agree he, that he's doing this on purpose yeah, now? Of course. He's of course. totally doing but this you know on what? purpose. He's, he, it's actually becoming a bigger story when he takes it down yeah. than if he would leave yeah, it of up. Course, of course. Part of his brilliance? Brilliance is a strong word. All right. um, <laughs> trolling, but it's effective a, trolling, I guess. A strategy, a sound strategy? I just think he likes to, you know, I think what he likes to do, I think he likes to, <laughs> I can't even use the language. Um, how do I say this without being censored? Poke the fans? He likes to um, he likes to walk into a room, give everyone the finger, and then walk right out, <laughs> and let everyone else deal with the aftermath. Right. right? That's sort of what he likes to do. I think um, I like to do it as well. It's, it, I'm sympathetic to wow. the move, but no, no, I mean I don't mean in that way. But you I just don't mean say. He, he just I think he likes to uh, cause trouble and then wash his hands of it and walk. But you know, you know he didn't start this really, like because the deleting thing. Said, no, I'm saying oh, okay. this this whole thing with the negotiation. The UFC has put all this stuff out about John wants, mm. John, we're going to renegotiate this contract with him. He's uh, actually he very private, for, right? He, he won't talk to any his, of us. No. Yeah, no, no. They've not returned any messages, right. any phone calls to anybody. The only thing we've seen from him is the Instagram videos that he's put out. <laughs> but essentially everything that we know about this is from what the UFC has told us. So how do we even know that that's really the truth, that he really wants Cormier? Maybe he said, oh, I have a preference to fight Cormier. Right. We don't know that it's like, oh, it's Cormier or bust. Like you well, said, that's I mean, why this it comes is, down to the contract. Sure, sure. I, I agree with you. But it, it's, yeah, okay. Let's do that. <laughs> well, okay. How, how, how about this, you know, the byproduct of the, of the John Jones situation? At the end of the day, he's going to come back to the UFC, right? He's gonna, 
is it is it the worst thing in the world if he fights Cormier and Gustafson waits? Is it bad for business because Gustafson was promised that, and guys have been promised tell shots in, in the past. You know, Machida, <laughs> Machida can count a couple times when he was promised. But is it the worst thing in the world if they bypass Gustafson, or would that be a gigantic mistake? Like, do they have to, you know, they're on the cover of the EA Sports game that's coming out. I mean, all this is kind of happening at the same time. That's what I mean. Do it's they have to make the fight? Towards this one yeah. fight. We've all been leading towards this one fight. So it's really just a change of perception suddenly. Oh, well, now we're going to have Cormier in there. No, it's not the end of the world. Because honestly, that it could be in sense of you'll never maybe get another, maybe you won't get the Gustafson Jones uh, sure. the, the second fight. Because Cormier, to me, is a legitimate threat to beat John Jones, and I think a lot of people would see that. That's what also makes it compelling. So it's like, you know, we, we, for years we were talking about, like, should Jones go up, or not for years, but for a long, for a while there we were talking about should Jones go up to heavyweight, he has no more challenges. Well, now one of the big heavyweights has come down, of course that's going to be a big fight. Um, so would I, would I want to see it? Of course I'd like to see it. I just, I just feel like Gustafson is positioned right now to be yeah. that guy. Gustafson would then have to probably stay busy himself, and then I, I'm guessing against another top guy, and you run the risk of him getting knocked off that ladder. So, if you're trying to, if you're the UFC and you're trying to cash in on that big fight happening, that you know to have the second part of that happening, I mean, you want it to happen now. I don't, I don't think you want to lay it to the future and risk uh, losing that. One more thing about all this, and I think you'll appreciate this this comment. Can we put the to to, to bed? that John Jones must go heel talk. What and, a stupid... And, and, and why I say this, <laughs> the reason I say this is, you don't go heel, and you certainly don't talk about going heel. You just be yourself. And if that means being an a-hole, that means this being an a-hole. This is what I've been saying for years. I, I mean, why are people now just all of a sudden it's, coming... It's really bothering you know, me. You know John Jones is a real person. Yes. He doesn't have to act like a cartoon character. It's, it's, it's really bothering me. John Jones must... And maybe I'm to blame for some of this, this, this talk as well. I'd say you're squarely to blame. I, I was, you're I am so about people no, going heel. No, but I hear his people because saying this to me now. <laughs> oh, we're going to go heel. He put out a video about this. Oh, I'm going heel. I you don't talk him. about going heel. That's breaking down the fourth wall. You right. just become... So who you are. Yeah, okay. Yes. You just are who Obviously you are. Obviously, he that has a heel. heel in him. Like, right. that's part of his, you know, who he is. He's just, Everybody does. Yes, he's, he just is not Some more than others. <laughs> Some more than others. Just be who you are. Like, to, 95 honest, the heel, heel term comes from pro wrestling, right? Yes, I'm, but I'm when aware. someone turns heel, they don't hold a sign on TV and say, heel, this is a heel. <laughs> he just does things yeah. that, you know, indicate that he's a bad guy. And also, like, I, I, you know, I, even, if he tries these, you even if he tries these manufactured attempts, at being something that the fans now demand on the flip side, at least the media demand on the flip side, like we want you to be evil. Even if it's that doesn't come natural to him, you'll, you'll yeah. talk if, this. If th that may come more natural than being Mr. Nice Guy, but after a time, even if that's not natural, you're gonna pick up on that too. Right. right? I think eventually by the time this guy's 30, he'll have found himself in some sort of medium. I don't know what it's gonna look like, but I, I just feel like the idea of John Jones manufacturing good, bad, indifferent, it never works. Mm. He's just gonna have to be complicated and we're just gonna have to accept it. All right, let's move along because the other big story from last week was of course the Chael Sonnen, Vanderlei Silva, Vitor Belfort love triangle, if you will. Talk about more fights that we've been promised for a long time. <laughs> we well, yeah. actually, that was that's part of my question. I mean, there's all this drama in the midst of all these fights. Is this taking away from the fights? I mean, here we are sitting, uh, you know, we've been sitting here for like 20 or so minutes, and you know, we're talking about a story that is about contracts and bout agreements and all this, and there's a fight this weekend. I mean, of course, on this show, we talk about those kind of things, but is this taking away? You put out something about John Jones, Chael Sonnen, Vitor Belfort, Vanderlei Silva, and it seems to draw a lot more attention than a, a preview of Henderson Khabilov. Is this so bad for the UFC? The question is, is the drama of the, the John Jones thing, the Vanderlei Silva thing, taking away from the fights that are going on this weekend or taking yes. away from those? No, from the fights that are currently on the schedule happening this week in Albuquerque, Vancouver. Is this bad for the UFC? Um, I would probably say yes. Except for the fact that it's almost a step back to take another step forward because they're in most of these instances, like the Chael Sun and Vanderlei Silva thing. Now, obviously, that was something that was out of the UFC's control. They had this fight scheduled and set up, and it was supposed to happen. And then Vanderlei, you know, no showed the test essentially. But the, the fight was scheduled; it was supposed to happen. All the talk and all the hype and everything that led up to it would have made helped make that a huge event. UFC right. 175 is probably going to be the biggest event of the year, unless Gustafson and Jones rematch, is gonna have the biggest buy rate. Um, and part of that is due to the fact that 
Chael Sonnen and Vanilla Silva have been in the public eye, and this feud of theirs, this rivalry, has been in the public eye for a couple of years now. And people have been waiting for it, talking about it, seeing these videos of Vanderlei stalking him at trade shows and all this <laughs> stuff. And yes, when it happened, maybe it was taking away from whatever event was happening at the time, but it ultimately would have paid off. Sure. Unfortunately, the fight's not happening. It's the same thing with this Gus and Jones thing. Now, we're, we're going on and speculating about what's going to happen with his contract and the fight. But it is, it's bringing a lot more attention to, to this fight. It's bringing a lot more. Pe people are just randomly going to come across it. If you're a, you know, a, a person who only checks in on MMA news once a week or twice a week, you're going you're gonna to run into that news and like, oh, what's going on here? Why, why, aren't, this guy, why aren't these guys rematching? When a fight takes place, you're going to be a lot more aware of what's happening. It's going to generate a bigger buy rate. So it's kind of, uh, you know, kind of one step forward, one step backward. But unfortunately, not every not every event could be a mega event, and that's is being it's, taken away from this. Weekend. It's really awkward too because you have one figure in this scenario, which is Chael Sonnen, who's sort of this omnipresent person who's all, all over the place. He's always has a pedestal. He always has a platform, yeah. I should say, on UFC tonight. He's always, you know, he's always kind of. We're always catering to what Chael is. So therefore, the fight itself, it doesn't matter really who he fights. You feel like it's going to be well promoted just because of the Chael Sonnen thing. But he's, the problem is he's now going up. Uh, these are like shadow figures we're talking about. We're talking about Vondale Silva, who he says was never going to take that fight. You know, sort of all of a sudden, you know, he escapes from the drug test, and now he's just sort of out there. You know, we don't know what he's got going on. And then Vitor Belfort, who's suddenly re-emerging from the same place and coming back into the picture. To me, the the the, the drama of that becomes Vitor Belfort. I, and all the weird stakes that are here, I, it doesn't. Nothing has really made sense. It's going to be 185. It's supposed to be 280. Now it's going to be at 205 again. Is 205. Yes, okay. Yes. I mean, to me, the, none of this. I think none of this as is of really, right now. Maybe, maybe yeah. cash win. We'll it's, it's, we'll all, all of this though goes into drama. Like we, I know I've written a couple of uh, pieces about it. You, you, you contemplate the logic behind it. You contemplate what is going on. At least if you're talking about these fights in one way or another. Um, it's going to work for Chael Sonnen. It's going to work for his fight. Does it take away from everything that's happening before it? Of course it does. Well, let's talk about... Did you want to weigh in on I this? mean, I'm not a big fan of Peggy Noonan, but her, her use of the term rolling calamity would be well used <laughs> here. I would just say, the only thing I would add just quickly is, you know, yes, does this detract from the fights this weekend? Sure. So do the 22 fights they put on last yeah. weekend, uh, which, very few of which were good. Uh, and, well, also, in fairness, the fights this weekend This is his actually, middle finger to the room. Right, yeah. No, 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 yeah, I'm, 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 leaving. I'm leaving. No, the truth is the fights this weekend are actually really good. The main card is really good. It's very hard to hate on it. Um, but, you know, if you put on a bunch of fights the week before, it's like, whatever, plus this overshadowing it. But I would say, on balance, if you have to sacrifice a Fox Sports 1 card, albeit a very good one, for what could be a huge event yeah. in the end, that's a trade you got to make. The, the, also, the the publicity of card gets is always proportional to what's at stake. And when you look at this card coming up on Saturday, it's a very good card, but there's not a lot really at stake here. Uh, like I disagree, I disagree. Well, so tell us why. Well, I mean, look down the fights. These are these are guys who are either on the either serious contenders. Or on the verge of being serious contenders. This is the fight card you're going to look at. In on the year. verge of being Plus serious it, this, contenders. This is not a, a huge thing for people. That's well, no, not it's not. It's okay. It's, it's not UFC 100. But I'm saying <laughs> that's something like people have to look at and grasp. It's it's much easier to say, oh, you know, this rivalry that's going on for sure, three years, for sure. or a title fight, something like that. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, this yeah. is a fight. I just mean, I just mean if you look at this card in a year and a half, two years, you're sure. going to be like, that dude's yeah, got a title shot. That dude got a title shot. Yeah, not Well, the main event is 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 fascinating. I think more so for Benson Henderson. If Benson Henderson loses. Two guys not in the top ten. That's devastating for his career, and he's kind of in this no man's line right now. Sure, I mean, that, that's it's a good card. It's a really. I good actually card. think this is very good matchmaking on the mm -hmm. UFC's part. They need to start creating some stars at 155 off of Benson's name. I like it. I mean, I actually give Benson a lot of credit for taking this fight. I think a lot of people well, wouldn't. He didn't know what he was yeah. doing at the time, apparently. Well, he thought he was Michael Man. Thought was Nurmagomedov. Yeah. <laughs> 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 he did yeah. originally. Oh my God. But it's all the same. I mean, it's all, same. Dog is all those white guys look the same. <laughs> what, what, what I mean is the sentiment is kind of the same. They're both not the biggest name. So he, yeah. he was taking a chance by taking this fight. And we've seen some guys say, no, I'm not going to fight that guy. He, he, he has to get a couple That's more wins. That's funny. So I give him a lot of credit for doing that. But I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, I think there's more, way more pressure on him than Khabilov. Right? Oh, I mean, 
I mean, enormously much more pressure, right? I mean, Henderson mm -hmm. is a guy who uh, has accomplished a lot. No one could take that away from him. But I think a lot of fans feel like this dude has been surfing on some wins he didn't deserve, on some decisions he did not get, uh, albeit close fights. You know, no one says he got bl uh, blown out. He loses the Pettis fight. Obviously, um, you know, that didn't do a whole lot of wonders for him. Havilov is a guy that there's some... And the Thompson fight, some people yeah. really lost. Oh, yeah, Thompson fight, right. Melendez fight, say, right. second Edgar fight. I mean, you, even the, some people, the first Edgar fight. It just goes on and on and right. on. The only and one I, he really beat was Diaz, I think. Yeah, so. Diaz, yeah, yeah, exactly. Beat Diaz and, uh, and then the, and Bocek at 129. But, like, you get the idea. So there's, here's this guy. Who feel, I, I, I think, let's be fair to him, he's a very, very good competitor. He deserves to be top ten. And I don't. I think fraud is a very strong word. But wow. I think uh, no, no, no. That's a strong word. But I think some Why people. Why did you say that? Because yeah. I think I think there's this. It clearly se comes to mind. I think there's this sense of he belongs among the top five, but he his place is exaggerated. Mm. And they're wondering if Habilov. I think even yeah. even UFC matchmakers might bring him down to earth a little bit. I like Henderson to win, by the way. Mm. But uh, it's a you know you got a guy in Habilov who has weaponized the takedown. That is nothing to sleep on. Up until about. A week ago, I was I, I kind of didn't understand this matchup, or I I, I didn't see it, but I, I rewatched Kabbalah's fight with Masvidal, who was a very, very good fighter. He's very complete and he's he's very technical, and I, that that fight made me believer that he deserves this fight with Henderson. I mean, the, the one thing that I see is going to make this an interesting matchup. He's a great scrambler, which against Henderson is a no small key, key. no small trait to have. And it's going to make the fight a lot more interesting. His striking's gotten a lot better in the, in the last fight or two. Um, you know, I think when he when he came, I, I talked to Mike Winklejohn recently. And he's basically said when he came to the gym, you know, he didn't have much in his toolkit when it came to striking. Last fight, we saw him do a spinning back kick and knock Masvidal down. Um, so he's he's one of these guys who's picking up things very quickly, and we've seen his wrestling seems capable of hanging with anybody. So. It's a credible matchup, and yeah, you, you, I wrote a piece for Fox this week about the rise of the Dagestanis, and we may see kind of the first uh, domino falling as far as the first Dagestani beating a real elite fighter in, in an international scene. These kinds of matchups always spark the imagination because you're used to seeing Vincent Henderson against guys you know 100%, you know? Yeah. But here we have a guy who's sort of on radar, he's coming up. Um, we've seen him in some good performances, but you don't know, but you have the feeling, right? Like with Nurmagomedov, Nirma, you've had the feeling, well, we've seen him actually very, very dominant, but you know that that guy's going to be a title contender very soon. Uh, it's the same thing. This guy's coming up. He's looking good. You don't really have a place for Benson Henderson right now because he's basically lost twice to Anthony Pettis. He's not going to get that shot again while Anthony Pettis is up there. Um, he's beat. And, you know, beat whether you want to put quotes around it or not, the guys, a lot of the guys in that top 10 space, there's only a couple of options. And to me, you know, since he is willing, and to his credit, he is willing to take this fight, you know, that makes a lot of sense to me. you got a guy who's coming up, um, who's, who's shown those glimpses, and we have that feeling with against a guy who we still have a little bit of feeling the other way that maybe he's not as good as we have him. So to me, it, I agree with Luke. I think it was you were making that point. It, it seems like they're a lot closer than we, than we original than the rankings would say. I guess. What, what a tough situation for Henderson though. Like as long, like you said, as long as yeah. Pettis is champion, yeah. he's not getting another shout. It's it's almost like he's like hanging onto a bar, <laughs> and it's just like just hang there until he loses because he's got to hold on to that number one right. spot. Favors in that spot, yeah. Joseph Benavidez. Yeah. Chad Mendes could be in that spot if he loses. Junior Dos Santos. Junior Dos Santos yeah. as well. Yeah. So it's the UFC's first time going to Albuquerque. I think they've put together a great card. Also, Diego Sanchez versus Ross Pearson. Uh, mm -hmm. Brian Caraway versus Eric Perez. John Dotson versus John Moraga. Which is, though, I mean, that is a that sick fight. fight. And Pettis. Jason High dropping down to lightweight. Yeah. Everyone, That's No one thought anything of TJ Grant when he was a welterweight. Right. He goes to lightweight and starts blowing people's brains out. I'm not saying that High will do that. It's worth giving him a shot, especially against if he can do well against Rafael Dos Anjos, look out. And man. and most importantly, the return of Patrick Cummins. <laughs> yeah, well, he's the only <laughs> fight pass fighter. Pass. From the uh, <laughs> from the co main event of a pay per view to the current jerker. Okay, so those fights are happening this weekend. One fight that could be happening in the future would be, in my opinion, gigantic for the UFC. Yeah, we Anderson are back Silva. Into the exactly. <laughs> but we got to talk about this one because I didn't this see is it coming. Take away from this weekend's fight and, stuff. No, but this is I good stuff. This is good there. stuff to talk about. This is not drama. <laughs> Anderson Silva versus Nick Diaz. We talked about Anderson Silva's return fight, and I'm not sure, correct me if I'm wrong, I don't think anyone brought up Nick Diaz when we were talking about it on that show. Maybe Wags when he was here, but who knows, you know, what he, he half the time, you know. Anyhow. Altering states, man. Come on, this is a no-brainer, right? I mean, 
th there's no one that can say something negative about I mean, there's no better option than this. I, I, I said this yesterday in my chat, or two days ago, whenever you see this. I'm not a religious person. I think you die, you just rot in the ground, and worms <laughs> eat your body. That's just what I you believe. You don't protect the box around you. Well, that fades, the whatever. <laughs> I, I just believe that when you die, that's it, man. But if there is a God, and I'm wrong, <laughs> he will make this fight. <laughs> who loses? So you know yeah. drops from the sky? I know, I know. I, know. I, I mean, who loses? Doesn't matter who which guy loses. It's 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 a fun fight. Um, if it, it doesn't even matter really who, who wins. I mean, it'd be bigger for Nick if you won, obviously, because yeah, of who Anderson sure. Silva is. But I think people would be forgiving if Anderson didn't look that great because he's coming back. Or if he did look great, he would reassert himself into whatever. Or if both guys looked great and it was a <laughs> war, they still could win. Nick could change weight classes. It, it's it, here's the only problem with it. And I want to take a point from uh, Jordan Breen. He made this on a recent one of his podcasts, the um, Press Row. He, he made a very excellent point, which I'll repeat here, which is that you know, UFC is really good at what they do. We'll put the number four guy versus number seven, mm -hmm. number one, number two. They're not really all that good with cork. They're not all that good with when you're trying to make a fun fight. You don't really know what it means, but it could be really fun for the fans. They're not really good with that. This is a situation that's like a no-brainer. Right. How do you not make this fight? He wants it. He wants it. Pay them. Let's see. Please take my yeah. money. Not to mention take my money. Is. Retired, coming back. Right. I mean, you're, you're putting a guy who they can't get out of retirement either way. So if you if he's willing to do it, why would he? He has always said the only two fights he's yeah. coming back for. He said that since day one. He's he stayed true to that. George St. Pierre not happening anytime soon, and Anderson Silva. And all of a sudden, Anderson and he said Can that you before the Anderson lost. Antics in that cage. All of a sudden, it falls <laughs> in his taunting. lap. What, there's one other one other good option, I think. Oh there's come on! Only Don't ruin our party option. here. The Bisping Kung Lee winner. Yeah. Does, does Nick Diaz just, Anderson no, no, Silva? No, no, Lee. I want to see it just like everybody else I mean, does. I agree with them. I mean, if yeah. they were going to do that, that would be the, an ideal thing for Anderson Silva, yeah. you know? Yeah, I mean, Bisping, Bisping has... It seemed like he was always going to get there, or he was going to sure. get there eventually. Never quite but did. But it would have nowhere near the appeal. No, no. But, but I mean, the, <laughs> and Anderson's in this. In England, sure, you know, but Anderson's in, in this spot now where he's not tied to a belt, where he can just right. have some fun fights. No, I mean, I if you could pull off Anderson Nick and then Anderson GSP when he comes back, can you imagine? They need those fights. Anderson versus Nick in their return fights to the UFC, could that get a million buys? Uh, can you imagine Nick Diaz saying, come on, bitch, yeah. and Anderson <laughs> Silva doing oh, one of his I would, down, saying, I know, I, you just over. wouldn't even know what but to is do it a, with But is it a mistake for Nick in the sense that from a Styles matchup, I mean, is Anderson too big for it him? It was a style matchup that's like GSP. Right. Right, I mean, what would, I mean, Anderson Silva is a bad style matchup for everyone not named Chris Weidman, really. Uh, so, uh, yeah, would I favor Size-wise, is he too big? Has ever fought at middleweight? I, I, I don't think he, he has. has. Yeah, he, he has. has. Yeah. yeah he fought but, I mean, this is a guy who's fought at 205. He's, yeah, he's, I remember, you know, a couple years ago, Caesar Grace saying, yeah, we, we'd fight fights at 205 if it made sense. So he'll, but listen, he'll Anderson Silva is one thing we're not giving him credit for. Yes, he's the best fighter ever, maybe, right? Certainly in the debate, him or St. Pierre or whatever. Maybe it's just him. But it, it, Anderson Silva is a little bit more these days. He's also a bit of a showman. Mm. And it, I don't think he would have a fight with Diaz that was like, I'm going to get this guy out as fast as possible. I'm not saying he would carry Nick Diaz, because I, I wouldn't rule out Nick Diaz winning, to be honest. But um, I do think they would have a fight that would be ridiculously. You yeah. think you think Anderson Silva's just going to jab and leg kick and circle? <laughs> Give me a break, man. He's going to do, they're going to, I'm telling you, why would you not make this fight? <laughs> Can you imagine the buzz? Yeah. Can you imagine the buzz in the crowd? I, I, I don't think As we've ever been out. more excited about an idea on the show. No, and again, what's, what's, do the, it. what's the downside? What's the downside? Well, it actually makes total sense. They're both well, coming off losses. Well, Nick has on his career and they can't renegotiate. Right, they don't, yeah, want, to give it to, they don't want to give it to the leverage. But I just mean, if you're a consumer where you're worried about their fighting futures, you're just like, I can't I can't really see a great reason not to do it. But I'm sure it won't happen because there's no God. Anyway, great. Oh, come on. Um, you know, while we're <laughs> talking about welterweight, right. <laughs> let's, at least, let's at least bask in this I'm for a couple more I'm days. I'm just teasing, I'm just teasing. While we're talking about welterweights, you know, they announced recently that Matt Brown versus Robbie Lawler, they're going to fight in July and the winner will fight for the belt. And they announced this, you know, a week or so before UFC 174, and there's a huge fight at 170 happening there. Tyron Woodley versus Roy McDonald, and you could have made a case for the winner of that fight being the number one contender. Did they take some of the steam away from that fight? Like, why not just wait to throw out that stipulation? Don't they throw out that stipulation like it's candy and so Halloween? So you don't even listen to it anymore? Like I, I don't Woodley. know, like, how, how, many, how often does this happen? When people, you know, we asked Dana, does the winner of this fight get a title shot? I, yeah, I can see. I, I don't. I don't know how you'd argue against it. You know, right. like and then we report. Oh, the we'll winners probably happens. get it. We'll I mean, this one yeah, we'll seems see. kind of in stone, though. Does it though? So you you think Tyron Woodley gets a vicious knockout? 
he'll he'll be the number one contender, or at least there'll be some momentum. It's hard for to that. imagine the Brown Lawler fight will be anything other than incredibly entertaining. Right. But what ha if it's if it's not for any b bizarre reason, and then Woodley goes out and has some incredible win, or or vice versa. Um, isn't that possible that the UFC would say, "Well, you know, you get, you get," or if, or if the winner fights and gets hurt and he can't fight? I right. mean, it, there's always so back to my like question. Does this coming. take anything away from that fight? Because I'm looking for. I think that's a great fight. Well, it seems to be almost, you know, psychologically like saying you guys need to go out there and perform. I mean, in some ways, it might mm -hmm. just be a little bit of you know, putting a match under these guys and saying like, make sure it's a good fight, and then maybe you. You know, you, you, I know that Woodley, uh, who's on your show on Monday, was basically saying that, you know, you, you never know what's going to happen. He has to, it's his job to go out there and sort of have a performance that will make the other things seem like it's secondary suddenly. And I, I feel like that's maybe what they were doing. I mean, the truth of the matter is Rory McDonald has not been having really great, fun, exciting fights as of late. So I feel like maybe they're looking at... Um, that being a potential dud, I don't know, maybe just a little bit there, given that card, that card is not the greatest card they put together, but they want that fight to actually stand out. Um, maybe it lights a little bit of a fire on them. But the, the bottom line is, we never know. They change those things all the time, and, you know, the bottom, the bottom line is too, like... This is a lot of bottom lines. There are, there are bottom lines. <laughs> the, the, well, I guess real, the truth is, the bottom line is there really is no bottom line. Like, we don't know until the it actually gets out. Neither Rory or Tyron really have an incredible winning streak where they can make an argument like, That's I really saying. deserve this. No one no guy has slot. really... It's like, okay, if you get it, great, good for you. No but, one guy has really distinguished himself. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. Nobody has... They've all been sort of imperfect in their own way. Uh, Matt Brown's on seven fight win streak, but those seven obviously haven't come against uh, top, top guys. He he would probably have the number one spot if he beats Lawler, especially if he did it the way he's been doing it. He How would you argue that he doesn't get it? But then again, you know, if 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 it ends up being a dud for whatever reason, or the guys get hurt, whatever, I could see Woodley if he went in there and smoked Roy McDonald being that guy. Also, real quickly, it gives Fox a promotional angle for Brown versus mm -hmm. Lawler. It gives them something to hang their hat on. Okay, the winner of this one, and that hasn't always worked out for pay-per-view buys in the past, <laughs> but it is good to have like a narrative about this fight. It's not just two guys who are really great fighters and fans love. Yo, the winner of this guy. At stake. So there's sub, sure. these two guys are good, and as they mentioned, they can just change their mind if the fight sure. sucks. I mean, and Lawler. Johnny Hendricks yeah. almost like he's the title. Right. So, so in the end, they can just change your mind, but at least it gives them a narrative to work around. All right, fair enough. I feel like I asked you guys this question on a, a previous episode of the show, but we'll end with this because last week, kind of out of nowhere, Dana White said that he had received a letter from Paul Daly's management team asking to reconsider his stance on Paul Daly being banned um, from the UFC. So here we are again, and Daly's not on an incredible winning streak. I believe he's won five of his last six, but Yakovlev. He's won one in a row, right? Right, but the guy <laughs> okay. who we lost to Yakovlev just got into the UFC yeah. off of that win. An exciting fighter. They're doing these fight pass shows. They could use names like him, especially in Europe. Should the UFC reconsider this? Should Paul Daly be back in the UFC? I, I understand why UFC is obstinate about it. They have some principles they want to stick by. Dana White, man, if you fault him, you know, he, he, he doesn't forgive easy. And I understand that. A lot of people are that way. That's fine. I, I just think the business side makes sense. The guy has served his penalty. Like, yeah. you know, the reality is Dana White is also the same guy who says when guys mess up and they serve their time, quote unquote, it's time to forgive them. I think they have. He's done a good job both in kickboxing and MMA yeah. on the regional side. They need these guys. And, you know, what's the point of keeping them out? Like, what harm could he possibly yeah. do to the brand at this point? Bring him back. He doesn't have a whole lot of time left in his career anyway. It makes a lot of sense. I completely agree. He it was, it was like 2010, right, when this incident happened? Yeah. And he's, he's not done anything to you know, bring any uh, it's not ill repute upon. Right. Yeah, he's, he's not done anything to bring any more ill repute upon among up, upon himself. Uh, you know, he's conducted himself like a professional, as far as I've seen in the time since then. Um, so yeah, as Luke says, I agree. He he serves his penalty. It's it's enough. Um, if, if they feel a need to bring an, an, an exciting welterweight, bring the guy in. It almost has less to do now with what happened with that cost check incident than it does just what's happened to his career since then. Because, I mean, if you go back, he hasn't really beat any big name guys. You'd have, you'd have to go back to 2010. But who's out they're, they're, there? They're, exactly, yeah, that's, that's what I'm saying. Yeah, it's tough. But, and he, but the guys he's lost to, you know, along the way, he's lost, you know, four or five fights. Misaki, uh, you were mentioned uh, the guy who just got Yakulov. And Woodley. And, Wood, and Woodley. Um, 
so, I mean, all these guys have sort of beat him. Any of his bigger challenges lost. So you, if you had any kind of reservation, it would almost be that. Like, he's not been faring well against the better competition the times he does get to fight them. But ultimately, when you get down to what, you know, what, what he's done, and he's made it pretty clear on your show and others that he's pretty contrite. You know, he's learned his lesson. And on, the, on those reasons alone, Dana White has given a lot of guys second chances. I feel like he's definitely earned his. I feel like you can sell a couple of Fight Pass subscriptions, some tickets with Paul Daly on the bill. And the UK is a market they've struggled with, you know? Yeah. I mean, why, why, why make it harder on yourself? Just, it, it's not a huge cost, and it could have a decent payoff. All right, guys, great show. I was excited going into it, now I'm more excited. Now we just we, gotta hope there's we, a god. Yeah. <laughs> Don't get your hopes up. Give us a sign. <laughs> I gave up years ago. Uh, thank you very much once again for watching the show, and uh, we want to hear from you, of course. A lot to discuss this week, and a lot going on. Still a lot unfolding in the crazy world of mixed martial arts, so let us know what you think in the comment section below. We're off next week for UFC 174, but have no fear, we'll be back after that to talk about everything that transpired in Vancouver, and of course, crazy world of the mixed martial arts beat. For Luke, Mike, Chuck, I'm Ariel. Thank you so much for watching. We'll see you next time.